Any questions about anything? <laughs> it's not as bad as it was yesterday and the day before. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't drive, actually. Yeah, I live close enough by so that I, I walk through the gorge up to my office, which is like 13, 15 minutes from my house. But in the winter, I have to walk around the gorge, so that makes it longer. Yeah. All right, any questions? Take it outside. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> Anything? No, it doesn't. Come on. But you never stop smiling, so it's okay. <clears throat> Remember what we were starting last time? We're starting this inner product spaces, Hilbert spaces, and all that stuff. We're trying to reframe Fourier series in that way. And this is going to prep us for our little unit on wavelets. So we started talking about inner product spaces. And Hilbert spaces, which is a special case of an inner product space. So the definition of an inner product. These are always complex vector spaces. Just the inner product definition. It's just a way of mapping pairs of vectors to complex numbers. It has certain symmetry properties and linearity and all that kind of stuff. And then we talked about examples of inner product spaces that we've seen. And these three fundamental examples, Cn, the set of all complex n-dimensional column vectors, little l2, the set of all square summable signals, and big L2 the set of all square integrable continuous time signals. And I showed you what the standard inner product on each of these things is. And associated with an inner product is a norm. So associated with an inner product is what we always call the associated norm. The norm of V is equal to the square root of the inner product of V with itself for all V in the inner product space V. And that makes sense to write down because one of the rules about inner products is that if you take the inner product of a vector with itself, you get a non-negative real number. That's zero if and only if the vector is zero. And we saw that the associated norm on C2 was the standard Euclidean norm and the associated norm on little l2 and big L2 were both the L2 norms that we met before. And associated with a norm is a notion of distance. And once you have a distance notion, you can talk about convergence sequences and, in fact, Cauchy sequences. And I define what a Cauchy sequence in an inner product space was. It, it looked just like a Cauchy sequence for real or complex numbers, except instead of magnitude of the difference, you're going to have norm of the difference. And a Hilbert space, so an inner product space V, is a Hilbert space when every Cauchy sequence converges. And all three of those, those examples over there are Hilbert spaces. So Cn, little l2, and l2 are all Hilbert. And remember, Hilbert is a German mathematician, so this is one of the German things. We have German things and French things going. 
throughout the semester. And during the number theory part, we could have had Hungarian things going because of Erdős, you know, because he was famous. Yeah, but we didn't. So, anyway, all right. So that's about where we were last time. Okay. Now there's a really important result that gets applied again and again when you're talking about inner product spaces, and this is true for arbitrary inner product spaces, not necessarily Hilbert. And that's called the Schwartz inequality. And notice that this is another German thing, at least ostensibly. Does anyone know what that word means in German? What did you say? White. He thinks it means white. Vice, Vice yeah. So what is? Black. Yeah, <laughs> black. Okay. <laughs> Schwarz means black in German, and there's no T in there. It's just. A t and incidentally, by the way, some people call this Cauchy's inequality. The Francophiles. And some people who want to be sort of ecumenical call it the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. But I learned it as the Schwartz inequality, so that's how I'm going to present it to you. Schwartz inequality, what does that say? If V is an inner product space, so in an inner product space V, we have the following relationship. If you take inner product of V with W and take the magnitude of that number that's bounded from above, by the norm of V times the norm of W. And remember, we're talking here about the associated norm, so that's V inner product with V to the 1 half times W inner product with W to the 1 half. And that's true for all V and W. This is a really useful inequality. And the proof is in the monograph. But let me tell you how it relates to, remember I said last time that the inner product on our abstract inner product space is sort of the sophisticated version of the dot product of two vectors that you learned back in, in grade school or whatever. And remember what that was if I had magnitude of V, so this is the relationship with quote unquote dot product. If, say, V and W are three-dimensional real vectors, then the dot product of V and W was magnitude of V times magnitude of W times the cosine of theta between V and W. And it doesn't matter which way you measure the angle because cosine is an even function. OK. What is, if I take the absolute value of the dot product, I get magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times the absolute value of cosine, and that's always less than or equal to 1. So I have this inequality here. And that's the same thing in R3 for dot products as the Schwartz inequality says in a general inner product space. So that's, that's a good mnemonic for it, if you want, to go back and draw on your previous background. Anyway, I'm not going to prove the Schwartz inequality in class. It's just a matter of you know bookkeeping and alphas and betas and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty easy. But I want to show you one application of the Schwartz inequality. Okay, so one quick application. Remember back when we were talking about convolution, criteria for existence of convolutions, we had both in discrete time and in continuous time, if you take two L2 signals and convolve them, their convolution exists and is a bounded signal. Okay, so recall that if X and Y are in L2, little L2, or big L2, then x convolved with y, or let's use x1 and x2 here. That's what we did last time. Then x1 convolved with x2 exists and is an L infinity signal, either little l or capital L. 
and we had an upper bound on the infinity norm of that signal. In either case, we had the infinity norm of x1 convolved with x2 is going to be less than or equal to 1 half times the 2 norm of x1 squared plus the 2 norm of x2 squared. And I told you back then, I don't know if you remember because I kind of said it under my breath, that we would improve on this upper bound. We would tighten it later on in the class when we had sufficient advanced knowledge. And we can actually use the Schwartz, Schwartz inequality to do that. So we can use the Schwartz to tighten this upper bound. How do we do that? This is just practice in understanding what inner products do and stuff like that. So let's, let's just do it real quick. And let's look just at the discrete time case because the argument for the continuous time case is, is exactly the same with the appropriate changes in the appropriate places. Anyone ever heard the expression mutatis mutandis? No? I don't know. It means with the appropriate changes in the appropriate places. It's a math term. Okay. So anyway, so let's look at L2. Case. So I'm given x1 and x2 in little l2. Now, for a fixed n in the integers, I'm going to let y be this signal with specification y of k is equal to x2 of n minus k with a conjugate over it for all k in the integers. Note, this signal y, all of its values over all the integers are the same as all of the values of x2 over the integers, except they're rearranged, right? You flip x2 and shift it and all that kind of thing. So since the values of y are the same as the values of x2, y is also an L2 signal for every n. Remember, we're fixing n to start this argument. And the 2 norm of y is equal to the 2 norm of x2. That's just the square root of the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of the values of those two signals, which are the same set of values. OK. Meanwhile, x1 convolved with x2 at any time n, that's going to be the sum over all k of x1 of k, x2 of n minus k, Right? This is for all n. But we can rewrite that sum as follows. The sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, x1 of k. This second term is the same as the complex conjugate of y of k. Right? with y defined over on the left. And that, by definition, the inner product is just the inner product of x with y. So far, so good. In other words, the sum giving us any specific value of the convolution of x1 and x2 could be rewritten as an inner product of two signals, one of which is the first signal, one of which is the second signal shifted in reverse with a complex conjugate over it. Thus.
for every n, we have that the absolute value of x1 can involve with x2 of n, which is the same as the absolute value of x inner product with that y defined above, is less than or equal to the product of the two norm of x1 with the two norm of y, which is the same as the product of the two norm of x1 and the two norm of x2. Because the two norms of y and x2 are the same. So the bottom line is, because this is true for all n, this is true for all n, that means that the infinity norm of x1 involved with x2, which is the soup of all those values over all n, is bounded from above by the product of the two norms of x1 and x2. And that's the improved upper bound on the infinity norm of x1 convolved with x2. And I just realized I left an infinity off of that one up there. So I'll fix that when we scroll the boards around. And I'll remind you. This improves on the old bound. It's easy to show that this product here is less than or equal to that right-hand side up there, the 1 half x1 squared plus x2 squared. OK, so that's a good thing to know. That's an elementary application of the Schwartz inequality. All right, so now we're going to get into the good stuff. Uh, well, at least what I think of as the good stuff. This whole idea of orthogonal expansions and all that business. And remember, the new wrinkle that inner product spaces give us over plain old vector spaces is, is a geometric way of looking at things. We have a notion of perpendicularity that comes from the inner product, a notion of angle between things, all that. And so that's where this is going to come into play. OK, so here's a definition. In an inner product space V, V and W are said to be orthogonal when the inner product of V with W is zero. And again, you can relate that back to the dot product on R3. When is the dot product of two vectors zero? It's zero when they're perpendicular, when the cosine of the angle between them is zero. That's what it means to be orthogonal. And so this is like being perpendicular. Okay, if I have a set of vectors, say w1 through wn, or a countably infinite set of vectors, w sub k indexed by k and z, so a finite or countably infinite set, and I'll call it just wk of vectors, so a vectors of v is said to be an orthonormal set when all of them are orthogonal to each other. And furthermore, all of them have norm 1. So when wk. And WL equals 0 when k is not equal to L. And the norm of WK is equal to 1 for all k. That's what it means to be an orthonormal set of vectors. And 
it's, you know, it's easy to talk sloppily about these things and still have it be very clear and not ruin the exposition. So I will, I will say this is an orthonormal set of vectors or these vectors are orthonormal, although that, that, that all means the same thing and I hope it doesn't bug you. Okay, now I'm going to fix this, put the infinity subscript where it belonged on this board. So, attention please, x1 convolved with x2 should have had a sub-infinity after the norm sign. Alrighty, so that's what it means for vectors to be orthogonal, orthonormal. And just a little aside here, there's, there's certain words that you have to be careful with when you're doing math, you know, careful about using in a sort of colloquial sense. And the word normal is one of them, okay? Be careful when you're talking about doing something in the normal way, or, because normal has a technical meaning in mathematics. In fact, it has several technical meanings, okay? Technical meaning number one is this one here. Ortho pertains to perpendicularity. Normal pertains to unit length, like normalized, right? That's what normal means here. It means unit length. But also, remember when you learned about you know, analytic geometry, you had like a plane and the unit normal vector, right? It's normal to the plane. Or when you learned about friction, you had uh, uh, you know, F equals mu times N, the normal force, right? Perpendicular. So, in another context, normal means perpendicular, whereas here, ortho is what means perpendicular. Be careful. What, what, is, another version, what is another meaning of normal that you can think of that's technical and mathematical? Maybe you haven't gotten there in 3100, hint, hint. Um, the normal distribution, right. It's another name for Gaussian right? L-shaped curve. So watch out. Watch out when you're using the word normal. All right. So anyway, that's what an orthonormal set is. One thing that goes under people's radar, and by the way, we're not covering linear algebra in this class, but there are chapters in the monograph that give, I think, a concise and plenty sufficient coverage of linear algebra. So if you've forgotten anything about what a basis is or what linear independent and all that kind of stuff, please read chapter four in the monograph to refresh your memory. So anyway, suppose, say W1 up through Wn is a finite orthonormal set. So those vectors are mutually perpendicular and they all have unit length. Question. Are these vectors linearly independent? How many people think that an orthonormal, finite orthonormal set of vectors is, definite, is, is necessarily a linearly independent set of vectors? How many people think that sometimes it might not be? Well, the majority is correct. So then the W's, the WK's are linearly independent. For some reason, that goes under people's radar sometimes. They, they say, well, wait, I know these vectors are orthonormal, but I don't know they're linearly dependent. I, I don't know why it goes under the radar. And, and it's really easy to prove this. Because if you have, say, a linear combo, C1W1 plus C2W2 plus CNWN equal to 0, and you take the inner product of W, say, 1 with that. So that inner product with W1 is going to be C1 times 1, because W1, inner product with W1 is 1, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, and that's equal to C1. And that has to equal 0 because that is equal to 0.
And you do this for each of the seats. And you find that any linear combo of the W1 to Wn that gives you zero has got to have all the individual C's be zero. So same for all the other CKs. All right, so orthonormal, finite orthonormal sets are linearly independent sets. And what do, you, what do you know? In a vector space, if you have a linearly independent set of vectors of size n, those vectors span, that's another word, you can remind yourself what it means by reading chapter 4 in the monograph, an n-dimensional subspace of the vector space in which they lie. Okay, thus, In this case, span of the set W1 up through Wn is an n-dimensional subspace. Let's call it capital W of V when the Ws are orthonormal. And when you have a linearly independent spanning set for a subspace, then take those vectors and put them in an n-tuple, you get a basis. And I'm being a little pedantic here, distinguishing between a basis as an ordered set of vectors and a set of vectors, or an ordered n-tuple of vectors and a set of vectors, but it's worth being that way sometimes. Okay, so what we've shown here is if you have n orthonormal vectors, they span an n-dimensional subspace, and the n-tuple of those vectors is a basis for that subspace. Well, suppose I have an n-dimensional subspace given to me. Someone up on Hope Plaza or over on Hope Plaza, actually from here it's slightly down on Hope Plaza, comes up to you and gives you an n-dimensional subspace of, of a inner product space and says, does this subspace have an orthonormal basis? And if so, can you produce one for me? What would you say? You would say yes to both questions or just yes to the first question? Do you know how to produce an orthonormal basis for a subspace if someone gives you a list of all the vectors in the subspace? Yes, essentially, but, but you, you need first to have a regular old basis, and then you, you Gram-Schmidt it. That's, that's another cool thing to happen to your name. Remember we talked about like Hamiltonian, Cartesian, where a part of your name has an I-N after it. If your name turns into a verb, you know, that's what the Gram-Schmidt process is. So let's, let's follow up on that. So in fact, if W is any n-dimensional subspace of an inner product space V, W has an orthonormal basis. In fact, it has uncountably infinitely many such things. So I will abbreviate that as zillions. And to see how that goes, let me just, and you're going to have to do a Gram-Schmidt on the homework soon enough. So here's, to see this, first you let V1, V2 up through Vn 
be any basis for W. And there are procedures for generating such things. You, you pick an arbitrary non-zero vector in W, and then you pick another one. And if it's linearly dependent, you throw it away. If it's linearly independent, you add it to the stack. You know, keep going like that, whatever. So let V1 through Vn be any basis for W. And what you do is you apply what's called the Gram-Schmidt. And these are two separate names. It's not like his name wasn't Helmut Gram-Schmidt. You know, it's two different people. And Gram has other stuff named after him, like Gramian. He has, a, he has an Ian thing. So I have never heard of a Schmidian. But anyway, what is the Gram-Schmidt Gram -Schmidt procedure? It's inductive. It goes like this. First off, you let W1 equal V1 divided by its own norm. So W1 has unit length by construction. And then assuming you have orthonormal W1 up through WK, you form WK plus 1 as follows. WK plus 1 is equal to VK plus 1 minus the sum from L equals 1 to K of VK plus 1 inner product with WK times WK. Remember, these are all numbers. These are all vectors normalized, divided by its own norm. And I'll do what my math professors used to do and put an arrow from the numerator into the norm sign on the denominator to indicate that you're just normalizing. OK, now, the cool thing about this procedure is not only does it produce an orthonormal basis, so here's a cool byproduct. For each k between 1 and n, the span of the first k v's and w's are the same. So the span of v1 up through vk ends up to be the span of the w1 through wk. And that's actually useful to know at times. And I guess byproduct has a hyphen, so I better put that in there. Yes? Say that one more time. K, K, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's in the shadow. Uh, hang on, Jay. I'm going to put this. Yeah. WL, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. These guys should be WLs. Very good. Very good. See that correction there? Q sub. Cool. Uh, that's that's an, an idiom, a US idiom. You've heard it before. It's a little more current than neat. Oh, it's a neat byproduct. No, that's 60s. What do you guys say now? No one says, like, the bomb. No one says that anymore, right? No. Except when they're, like, kidding around, right? What's that? Cool beans? Uh... <laughs> No, cool beans is the noun form of cool. This is the adjective form of cool. Like, this is a cool byproduct, but as a byproduct, it's totally cool beans, right? All right, let's. OK, now you may say, wait, you know, what's wrong with the Gram Schmidt? You know, like, we're dividing. What if, we, what if we're dividing? Hang on, Nathan. What if we're dividing by 0 here? We're not, because, because of this byproduct thing, this guy here is a linear combo of the first k v's which are linearly independent of vk plus 1. Therefore, you could never get that numerator to be 0. But anyway, you can read about that in the monograph. Nathan, go so the denominator is the norm of the whole thing? Yeah, the denominator is the norm of the numerator. That's what this arrow down means. 
Okay. So anyway, you can create an orthonormal basis starting with an arbitrary basis for, by gram schmitting the vectors. All right, now, in, a, in an inner product space, there's a problem that often arises. And this is, this is something that comes up in any kind of optimization, least squares optimization. So this is a useful kind of thing to know. So here's a problem, and I'll try to explain how it comes up in optimization. So. Suppose you're in an inner product space V. If you're given V and V, well, let's start with W. Given W, an n-dimensional subspace, of V, and some vector, little v in capital V, find the vector in the subspace W that's closest to V. Now, what does close mean? Close means in the norm. OK, so that is find v hat in w such that the norm of v minus v hat is less than or equal to the norm of v minus w for all w in capital w. Okay, now why does this come up in optimization? The typical thing is you have this you have this inner product space and think of the vectors in the inner product space as say choices you make or outcomes that you're you're looking at. And the only accessible ones happen to be in the subspace W, but the one you'd really like to have happen is some other V in the vector space V. So you want to get as close as you can given the constraint that your solution lies in W to that desired V. And that's when you're solving this kind of a problem. <clears throat> okay, so within three seconds, suppose I'm given this problem and suppose the little vector V is in W. What is V hat? Okay, let me repeat the question and I'll count the seconds again. All right. I've got this V, I've got this W, subspace W, and I have a vector V, and I want to find the vector in W closest to V. What if V, that vector, is in the subspace W? What is that vector V hat? Yes, V. Okay, so it's trivial. It's a trivial problem here to solve when V is in W. The answer is V. So here's the solution. V hat is V when V is in W. But in any case, whether V is in W or not, So V in W or V not in W, it turns out that V hat is equal to the following. V hat is equal to the sum from k equals 1 to n of the inner product of V with WK times WK, where the Ws are any orthonormal basis for capital W.
And it turns out that this expression here on the right hand side comes out to be V when V is in the subspace W. And in the monograph, there's a proof of this. It's not hard, but I, I'd rather draw pictures and talk about what it means geometrically than go through the kind of analytical argument. So proof is in the monograph. But let's look at some pictures. And I'm terrible at drawing pictures, so. First, let me tell you what this V hat is, what people call it. And why they call it that. Note that. If I take V minus V hat, the difference between V and this optimal solution, and I take the inner product of that with any of the WKs, what do I get? I get VWK, inner product, minus the sum from K equals 1 to N of VWK. Let's do L equals 1 to N here times WL, WK, and all the terms in that sum, except for one, are zero by orthonormality, and that's the kth term. So what this says is that the difference between V and this optimal solution V hat is perpendicular to every W in the little set W1 through WN. But because that's a basis for capital W, this difference has to be perpendicular to every W in the subspace W. So V minus V hat, inner product with W is 0 for all W in cap W because W1 through Wn is a basis for W. In other words, the difference between the vector V and the optimal solution in W is perpendicular to the whole subspace W. And for that reason, they call V hat the orthogonal projection of V onto capital W. So the terminology V hat is the orthogonal projection of vector V on to subspace W. And so here's the picture I want to draw, then we can take the three minute break. Suppose that the whole board and the room, say, are, are V. And let's see if I can do this. So say this is zero, okay? And say that my subspace W is like a plane kind of thing, like so. Let's see if I can draw this. And V is up here. So you can think of V as being an, an arrow from the origin out to V. If I drop a perpendicular onto W from V, I get V hat. And you can just look at that picture and you can see, kinda, that V hat is the vector in V that's closest to W, closest, the vector in cap W that's closest to V. If I go anywhere else in W, the difference between V and that vector is going to be a longer length than the distance between V and V hat. 
Okay, so that's a good time to take the three minute break. So why don't we do that and then we'll continue on with this stuff. Anyway, now we, we have this notion of If you guys can't, if you guys can't, let, you know, get back into the swing of things, we're going to have to cancel the break for now. <laughs> no, no. I need the break. I mean, it helps me to, re, you know. Fall break? I think I'm just going to go visit family in Massachusetts. My mom lives in Hopkinton, and my sister and her husband and the two kids live in Holliston, which is right next door. It's, my mom's town is, is 26 miles, 385 yards west of Copley Square. How do I know that? Because this is the starting line of the Boston Marathon is like a block away from where she lives. So. Okay. Okay, so anyway, um, here we go. We, ha we have this notion of orthogonal projection onto a subspace. All right, and we want to build off of that. So far, we, we, we've only talked about these finite dimensional subspaces. And capital V is not necessarily a finite dimensional inner product space. It could be L2 or big L2, whatever. It's not just generally going to be CN. So what I want to do is I want to carry this forward in that context. And then we'll go back to Fourier series and see how it applies. OK, so suppose. I have an inner product space V. And a finite or countably infinite orthonormal set. And I'm going to give this a name, script W. And I hope that. That looks a lot like the Wegmans W, <laughs> doesn't it? You notice weird things when you're walking around town. Like I was in the city, and, I no and this proves I'm a total nerd. But I, I noticed that the, the Vans logo looks like square root of Ans. See, doesn't that? Doesn't that? Uh, oh, yeah. All right, so this is an orthonormal set to Wegmans, say WK. So WK could be W1 through WN if it's a finite set, or it could be WK for all K in the integers if it's a <coughs> countably infinite set. We say that script W is a complete orthonormal set. What does it mean to be a complete orthonormal set when the only vector in V perpendicular to every one of the Ws so the only V in V satisfying V inner product WK is 0 for all K is 0, the 0 vector. That's what it means for a set to be a complete orthonormal set in an inner product space V. OK, our goal is going to be to show that if V happens to be a Hilbert space, so here's the overarching goal here. The, I'm going to give it to you in, in sketchy form first. And we're not going to prove this all in detail in class. I'm just going to give you a bullet list of highlights, and you can read the details in the monograph is to show the following. Show that if V is a Hilbert space, that is to say, a, a inner product space in which every Cauchy sequence has a limit, and W is a complete orthonormal set, In V, 
We want to show that when this is true, every vector in V can be written as a linear combination of the vectors in W. And we have to be careful because linear combination is really only a finitary kind of operation. So I'm going to put that in quotes. So every V and V can be expanded as a quote unquote linear combo of the vectors in W. Okay? What does linear combo mean? It means the usual when W is finite. So when script W is just W1 up through Wn, all it means is V equals the sum of some constants, call them CK, K equals 1 to N, CK, WK. When W is countably infinite and its elements, as we can assume without loss of generality, are indexed by the integers, By the way, don't ever lose your cell phone in this room because I, I took, I, remember we found that, you guys found that cell phone last time and, and so I took it, I put a note on the board, I took it up to Sue Bulkley. She immediately started playing with it, trying to open it, you know, and she couldn't, of course, like anybody else. And she said, I like it when they leave it open because then I can go into their contact lists and I can, you know. So if you lose your phone, the moral is that someone in ECE is going <laughs> to maybe learn some things about you you don't want them to know. I mean... But of course, this is with the altruistic goal of, of you know, getting in touch with you, calling your home phone or you know, whatever. Calling your mom. That's what she said she did. She called a student's mother once. She said there was a contact mom. You know, so she called that person. Anyway. So that's what linear combo means when W is a finite set. And so when W equals, say, the set of all WK, such that K is in the integers, So that's countably infinite. The meaning of a linear combo is this, that you can find some constants such that the limit as n goes to infinity, the norm of v minus the sum from k equals minus n to n of ck wk is equal to 0 for some constants ck K in the in integers. I don't need that. So that's what an infinite linear combination means here. Okay? All right, so what do you think is going to happen? The, the, the point here, the answer is easy when W is finite, and when W is infinite, it's just a natural extension of that. Okay? What's going to happen is this term here, okay, so assuming, let's, let's get rid of the finite case first, it's easy. So when W is finite, W is actually a basis for all of V, an orthonormal basis for all of V. By completeness, if W were not an orthonormal basis for all of V, there would be some vector little v in capital V that's not in the span of the vectors in script W, and that's not possible by completeness because there would be a piece of V that's perpendicular to all the W's. And that linear combo over there is just going to be what we've derived already. Sum from K equals 1 to N of inner product of V with WK times WK. 
Okay, so now let's go to the infinite case. That's the interesting one. And by the way, if you ever have you have you ta Zach taken like Cussie's classes or mathematical physics? Okay, so when you do quantum at, at that level, do you see these Hilbert spaces and you call them bras and kets and everything, and and you have these orthogonal expansions? You've seen this before, right? So the moral of that story is that it's useful to learn this stuff, even if you're in A and E P. You don't have to be a signals guy or woman to learn this stuff and have it be useful in your life. Okay, so when W is infinite, what's going to happen is the following. It turns out that this sum, I'm going to call it S sub N of V, which is the sum from K equals minus n to n of v inner product wk times wk. That thing is, we already know, the, the ortho projection of v onto the span of all the wk's between minus n and n. Okay, here, let's pause, reality check. This space, span of the WKs as K runs from minus N to N, what dimension is that space? You think it's n-dimensional? 2N. 2N? Is there 2N different? Are there? You're close, you're close. 2N plus 1, right. Because K equals 0 is in there. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so you must be a MATLAB guy. You don't, you don't think about zero. You don't start from zero, you start from one. Yeah, okay. C people always start from zero, right? What does Python start from? Zero. Okay. What about Java? Zero. All the, all the quote-unquote real languages start at zero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I had to learn MATLAB last spring for my class, I, at least a little bit, you know. I, I never really had bothered to learn, learn it before, but it, it's fun to play with. All right, so anyway, this is a, a 2n plus 1 dimensional subspace. Anyway, it turns out that this Sn of v converges as n goes to infinity to v. And it's pretty easy to make that understandable. <laughs> so it turns out that that S N of V converges to V as n goes to infinity. That is to say, the limit as n goes to infinity of V minus Sn of V norm is equal to zero. And if you look up at what we were trying to show there, the coefficients v, inner product of wk, are just going to be the ck's. The constant ck we're looking for are just ck equals v, inner product wk. The same formula we would have had for the coefficients had w been a finite set. And what's the idea here? The idea here is that as n grows, so this is the intuition, as n gets larger, 
these two n plus one dimensional subspaces expand and expand and expand. They keep adding dimensions. So the subspaces span of the w's between minus n and n, of which there are two n plus one, Those are nested subspaces. The next one out contains the next one in because you're just adding on a couple of w's. So these guys are nested. And they expand outward to include all of v. Why do they end up including all of V? Because if they didn't get to all of V, there would be some leftover thing in V that was perpendicular to all of them. And such a V is not there because the set script W is a complete orthonormal set. So all of V is because set W script W is complete, nothing except zero is perpendicular to every vector in script W. Okay, so, so really, if you want to talk sort of casually, if you want to explain this to someone who's not, well, say, say you're talking to someone who's only ever learned finite dimensional linear algebra. They know, they know what a basis for a vector space is. They even know maybe what an orthonormal vector basis for a vector space is, but they only know these things in finite dimension. In a sense, what's going on here is that a complete orthonormal set in a Hilbert space so a complete countably infinite orthonormal set in a Hilbert space, and the Hilbertianness is important to get things to converge properly. You know, there has to be somewhere for them to go, and that's where Hilbert comes in. Is like an quote unquote infinite orthonormal basis for V. even though really we don't like to use, I don't like to use the word basis except when we're talking about finite dimensions. And we can recast in it where we're doing sloppily whatever in not a very information losing way. We can recast limit as n goes to infinity of the norm of v minus Sn of v equals zero as this. V equals, I'll put this bit in big quotes because this isn't really a valid expression. V equals the sum from K equals minus infinity to infinity of CK or of inner product of V with WK times WK. So really that expression looks exactly the same as the finite one except now instead of going k equals 1 to n, we go k equals minus infinity to infinity. All right, so that's the intuition behind all this result. And, and like I said, I'm not going to prove it in class, but I, I think it's, it's easy to get the general idea because it's easy to think, uh, relatively easy to think about these notions of perpendicularity, the geometry that's going on, visualizing these w's as kind of expanding, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and encompassing all of v because there's nothing perpendicular to everything in the 
in W's and all that. Okay, now how, do, how does one actually go about proving this? I'm going to give you three things that you need to do to do it, and it's in the monograph, but, but let me just give you the basic idea. It goes like this. It goes like this. First of all, for any n bigger than 0, you can write v as Sn of v plus the difference, v minus Sn of v. So you can write v as its ortho projection onto the w, w minus n to n and the difference between v and that. So this is like a v hat sub n, so to speak. And if you take the inner product of that with itself by orthonormality, you can show that the norm squared of V is equal to the norm squared of Sn of V plus the norm squared of the second term. Okay, that's where you start. And what this shows is that Sn of V norm squared is bounded. Therefore, you have an absolutely convergent sequence that is therefore convergent. So from this it follows that Sn of V converges and so does the other term on the right hand side. And that's where Hilbert comes in. Because you need absolutely summable implies summable and that only happens when you're in a Hilbert space. So from this follows, and you need Hilbert here, not the guy, that would be too bad, that Sn of V converges, as n goes to infinity, to something. V minus Sn of V converges as n goes to infinity to something that's orthogonal to all the W's. Because the W set, script W, is complete. That something orthogonal to all the W's has to be zero. So that second something equals zero by completeness of script W. And if you go back to that first equation there, V equals S N of V plus V minus S N of V, the second term as N goes to infinity goes to zero, the first term has to go to V. V equals Sn of V plus V minus Sn of V. The fact that this goes to zero means that this must go to V as n goes to infinity. And that's how the proof goes. Okay, that's the sketch. And you can, you know, take that line drawing and put flesh on it by reading the monograph if you want. But you know, like we're not going to test you on that, obviously. I, I really, though, I really want you to get this intuition. I really want you to think about this intuition behind this idea of what it means for an orthonormal set to be a complete orthonormal set in a Hilbert space. It means that essentially that you can expand anything in the Hilbert space as a linear combo of all the vectors in that set. 
So it behaves, like I said, like an infinite orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space. Okay, so why don't we leave it at that for today? And remember, there is a prelim next Wednesday in class, and I'll try to remember to put up solutions to last year's prelim when I get around to it. And also, again, uh, if you have, if you want to pick up your homework one, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you did that, because these things end up kicking around my office for years if people don't pick them up.